Hello, everyone, and welcome to this new edition of Your Question, the bi monthly webinar of the Jacques Delors Institute. Today, we have the pleasure to welcome Karin Talberg, researcher at the Jacques Delors Energy Center and co author of the recent publication, The European Green Deal in the Face of, Razi of Rising Radical Right Wing Populism. <laughs> the continued implementation of the European Green Deal will take place in an increasingly challenging geopolitical, social, and e economical environment. Implementing it, it will require substantial transformation of our society, which can create a high level of uncertainty among the population, concerning, for example, jobs, mobility, or quality of life. Lessons from member states, Sweden, Germany, Italy, and Poland, with a strong presence of radical right populist party, show that the rise is particularly an expression of political frustration. So in this context, how can we still implementing the European Green Deal? Do we, de do we need a regulatory pause, pauses as suggested by Emmanuel Macron? And how could the EU respond to citizen fear on climate? Karin, you have the floor. Thank you. Um, so we can go to the next slide. Uh, once more, thank you. Thank you, Lara. I'm happy to be here today to talk about this new publication co-authored uh, by me, together with Thierry Chopin, Camille Defarge, Clarvé Carnes, and Alicia Barbas. Um, so these are the, the overview of the points I will be going through today. But since this is a very short format, uh, I will just move to the next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, so uh, since the European Green Deal's introduction in 2019, uh, we know that the EU has made significant legislative process towards its 2050 climate neutrality objective, uh, including uh, through the adoption of the Fit for 55 climate and energy pack pack package, which is now entering into its implementation phase um, at the national level. So the Fit for 55 package um, means a 55 reduction of emissions by 2030 to reach the climate uh, objective. Uh, the European Union's climate objectives um, uh, by 2050. And as we know, um, uh, implementing this will um, translate into large transformations of our societies, uh, the industrial, transport, building sectors, as well as the energy system. Um, and uh, together with that, um, there are potentially negative distributive impacts uh, of these policies if social aspects are not sufficiently considered. Um, we also know that successfully implementing the Fit for 55 regulations at the national level will require additional policy effort to provide both financial, technical, and human resources that currently are inadequate. Uh, at the same time, uh, as we are undertaking this big challenge, uh, implementation challenge, um, the context is increasingly challenging in itself, both the economic, social, and um, geopolitical context. Um, we are today living uh, under high inflation, we have a cost of living crisis, threatened competitiveness, uh, and an increasing strain on public budgets. Um, and uh, in the midst of all this, um, radical right-wing and far-right populist parties are gaining ground in the EU, as we've seen in elections in, in numerous uh, member states during the past years. And above the factors that traditionally have explained this populist moment, um, such as trust in distrust in institutions, uh, fear of individual and collective decline, and as well as identity and cultural factors, um, what we see and the success of these parties today is um, can kind of be found uh, in a very specific national and European context, which is characterized um, by strong pessimism about the socioeconomic situation as a result of these recent crises um, uh, that we have seen. Uh, for example, stagnation of activity and inflation resulting from the pandemic, as well as um, subsequent geopolitical and energy crisis. Um, so the, the lack of trust in institution, institutions to kind of tackle these big challenges that people are worried about um, be, 
um, fuel spares against change. And as I just mentioned, the green transition will require substantial changes, uh, which thus uh, kind of translates into high levels of uncertainty uh, for the population. Um, at the very same time as populism appears to be a symptom of this mistrust. So all in all, um, the context is quite difficult as we see it. And moving on a bit to um, the radical right wing populist parties attitudes towards uh, climate, energy and environmental policies when it comes to climate, their attitudes range from explicit rejection to more of and of an affirmative stance toward the scientific mainstream, including everything from delaying, disengaging, or being very cautious. Um, what we see um, uh, is that in this context, these parties are increasingly found to instrumentalize environmental energy and climate policy to provoke resentment and frustration among parts of the population who are or who feel threatened by the changes uh, required to achieve the climate objectives. And they're pri primarily doing this uh, by drawing on a narrative that is nationalist and Eurosceptic, turning the regard inwards, um, saying that the transformation of our energy systems is only legitimate if it primarily or even only benefits the, the own nation. Um, or, not or, and, and the narratives are also anti-elitist. So we know that the EU is often being um, uh, criticized for being a very institutionalized set of institutions. And here, uh, climate, energy, and environmental policy is particularly um, vulnerable to critique because of uh, how um, the decision-making within these um, um, policy fields are so heavily relying on expertise and science. Right. So um, we have done case studies, as Lara said, in Sweden, Germany, Poland, and Italy, uh, looking at how the radical right-wing parties there kind of influence and how they position themselves on these topics. I won't be able to go through all the details, but some, some general conclusions are uh, that these, the success of these parties um, is partly an ex expression of political frustration in the face of what I mentioned before, deteriorating living conditions and fear of downward social mobility, also from the middle classes. Uh, and we also see that as energy and climate policies start to more directly impact the lives of citizens, which we, for example, saw um, this last summer with the big debates in Germany over the phase out of the fossil boilers. So what we see there is that even though for these parties in general, energy climate uh, issues are not their core priorities, but the insufficient consideration of social aspects with regards to these policies leads to a very easy instrumentalization, um, kind of using uh, these topics to win votes. Um, we also see that these parties um, fail to adopt a constructive stance on climate and energy policy. And while they criticize the lack of integration of social aspects, um, of the transition by the ruling parties, they themselves do not have very concrete solutions. So at the same time as we see, as they tend to moderate their positions a bit, uh, so both in Poland, Sweden, and Italy, although on different topics, but um, while their positions are moderated, this failure, or I should perhaps say unwillingness to constructively um, come with proposals uh, as risks adding further delay uh, to the transition when these parties come closer to power or maybe even in power as in Italy. And we can also see like in the case of Poland uh, that the legacy of the far right rule, um, because as we all know that uh, the law and justice party is no longer in government. They have recently, um, yeah, there's recently been an election and a new government has taken, um, taken, uh, taken power. power. Um, but what we see is that the legacy, for example, of rule of law breaches, 
uh, and other types of anti-democratic legislation, um, it really it's a, it creates a challenging situation for succeeding governments to take on these types of big challenges. Uh, we can move to the next slide. Um, and what we're seeing in the midst of these um, very anti-Green Deal discourses is that uh, both liberal but also conservative leaders um, are showing signs of much more ambivalence on how to respond to this. So we see, for example, uh, Emmanuel Macron, France's president, in May last year called for a European regulatory break on environmental rules for the next EU policy cycle. Although he said this because he also wants to talk about the financing of the green transition, which is an, a, a crucial cornerstone, what we see in this context is that this type of um, this type of um, wording is not neutral, and what it does in the absence of a strong alternative political discourse is that it ca can even lead to normalizing or leaving more space uh, for the radical rights uh, critiques against the Green Deal. Um, so we can move to the next slide. Um, can move back. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry about that. But I, I also wanted to speak just a little bit about the European Parliament. Um, because as we know, among the institutions, the European Parliament is the, the environmental champion so far. But what we've seen now uh, lately is that the status is kind of being uh, challenged from within. Um, even before Emmanuel Macron made his statement, the European People's Party, so the conservative um, Christian democratic right uh, called for a moratorium on green legislations uh, for a couple of years to avoid putting extra burden on industry. Um, and so this goes a little bit along the same veins as what I said uh, before. Um, but what I want to highlight here is that we also see within the European Parliament that even though the big coalition, so with the EPP, uh, SND and Renew tend to has during this legislative cycle won the most uh, votes on amendments on the Green Deal. We see specific, specifically on topics that relate to agriculture and environment, we see um, a rapprochement, uh, a close kind of the EPP moving closer to the positions of ECR, so the conservative right, and ID, the radical right. Um, so um, now you can move to the next slide, because what we've seen on certain on the, of these votes, uh, that I cannot go into <laughs> much depth, but that the reason why this kind of right-wing coalition has been able to win, for example, on the report on the use of pesticides, was also because uh, certain MEPs from SND and Renew start, decided to side with EPP. So it also shows kind of um, you know, it shows divisions within these parties as well. Um, and as you see in this slide, this was a poll uh, done by Politico um, in December. Polls are looking quite similar now. Um, but what we can see is that if, so if the conservative and radical rights, so ECR and ID gets even more votes and these kind of internal divisions persist, um, the Green Deal could become challenged during the next uh, legislative cycle. Um, so moving to the next slide, I will try to go a little bit faster because I'm coming to the end also. Um, the message we want to convey through this paper is that as a response to this, instead of ambivalence and kind of these types of statements and these types of behaviors that we have seen, what we believe that we need is a strong alternative narrative uh, for the European Green Deal. Um, so um, we believe that in order to build this new narrative, um, that building trust uh, is one of the most critical challenges for the continuation of the Green Deal. Uh, both citizens and stakeholders need to trust that individual and collective constraints and concerns 
will be acknowledged and taken into account by policymakers to confidently be able to engage in the green transition. Uh, so this new uh, alternative narrative that we're putting forward puts emphasis on support towards change, protection against negative impacts, and increased dialogue with citizens and stakeholders. And we believe that this could improve the effectiveness and also the legitimacy uh, of climate and energy builders, uh, policies to, to build trust in the green transition. Um, so overall, um, the recommendations we make is to offer support and the protection depending on the differentiated capacity to change and the differentiated impacts of the transition. Uh, we, for example, uh, suggest an increased EU budget to fund clean infrastructure programs, a really green industrial uh, energy policy, uh, and strengthen support to household and businesses uh, and regions, um, as well as active employment and skills policies. Um, we, the other part in this is the development of more uh, inclusive, open, and interactive governance. Um, for example, both providing better um, quality data to be able to evaluate um, um, green policies, also uh, continuing to experiment with citizen assemblies. We, for example, suggest an EU level citizen assembly on climate um, to be able to explore socially acceptable um, green policies, and we also believe it's important to beyond citizens in, uh, include all stakeholders uh, in dialogues um, towards um, the implementation of the Green Deal. Um, and we believe that if the European Green, uh, to green Deal toolbox is complemented with such policy measures, uh, it could have the potential to contribute to addressing uh, both the political frustration and fears that are partly responsible uh, for the rise of the radical right-wing parties today that are equally threatening the cohesion of our societies, the robustness of our democracies, as much as the green transition and future European prosperity. Thank you. Thank you, Karin, for your very strong presentation. And I know that you and your colleague from the Jacques Delorey Energy Center will closely monitor um, the campaign during the uh, European election. So we see a few questions, uh, maybe a first one. So last week, 18 MEPs from uh, right-wing uh, political parties signed the resolution um, calling for the Green Deal to be abolished. Um, so can really the European Union draw back on the Green Deal? Um, from my point of view, I see this more as um, a political strategy ahead of the elections rather than something that could have a, a real impact. However, of course, if, if as I said in my presentation, um, if, uh, for example, the ECR and the ID grow uh, substantially, uh, which also then leads to kind of showing the divisions that do exist mm -hmm. both within the EPP, but also the other large party groups such as SND and Renew. Uh, of course, I think that the, ambi the, the ambitions of the Green Deal risks to be uh, decreased. Um, but I think the abolishment of the European Green Deal uh, completely, um, I think it's more of a, you know, a political strategy ahead of the, the elections to really show off their anti-Brussels uh, stance. Uh, thank you. And um, in your paper that uh, is shown and available uh, on the Jacques Delors website, uh, you call for a better participation of citizens and the climate process. Uh, so could you maybe expand on the, the energy citizenship uh, yeah. project? So energy citizenship is um, uh, something that I've been working closely on for the past two and a half years. And it basically talks about, so um, the citizen engagement and involvement in the energy transition. And it very much touches upon these questions, also these very political questions of the roles of citizens today and what means they have to actually 
um, undertake changes and what means and opportunities they're given to to have a say, to to have a voice and to have an impact. Um, so what we see there, which is also very much what we um, what we uh, wanted to say with this paper, is that uh, the green transition needs to be socially just. Uh, clean solutions need to be easily accessible and affordable. Uh, um, otherwise, we I believe that we will see if member states uh, cannot kind of respond to these challenges. I, I believe we will see more social backlash and perhaps, which could perhaps also fuel uh, rising populism, particularly in these times where where we see, for example, in recent um, Europe, uh, Eurobarometer by the European Parliament, that really the socioeconomic concerns of citizens are on the top of the agenda uh, ahead of the elections. Um, uh, thank you. Coming back for uh, what you mentioned during your presentation on the European Parliament, why do you think that the EPP is uh, coming uh, near the SCR position on the field of the Green Deal and climate issue, knowing that Ursula von der Leyen is from the EPP um, parties and, and she's the president of the European Commission and, and she advocated uh, during this whole mandate for the European Green Deal, so it's a bit of, of a contradiction. Yeah. I think it's important here to kind of differentiate between the climate and energy files on the one hand and the files that touch upon uh, agriculture and environment on the other hand, because it's particularly on the files that relate to agriculture and environment where we've seen that the EPP is closer um, to the positions of ECR, but even to some extent of, of ID. Um, so to respond to your question, well, for example, what we saw with the um, nature protection um, legislation. Yes, that's not the correct word, but I hope you know which one I'm talking about. We saw this big campaign um, by Manfred Weber, uh, the leader of the European People's Party, um, to and really talking about you know the agricultural question, which is another hot topic ahead of the elections. Uh, where also the far right is trying to kind of, you know, take uh, ownership of the question. But that's also what the EPP is trying to do. Uh, they're trying to show that they are kind of, you know, we are on top of this question. We are the voice of the farmers. Um, whereas on the climate and energy files, they have rather been part of the, the large coalition there with SND and Renew who have actually managed to get these files through. Um, but on your question uh, with regards to, so Manfred Weber and Ursula von der Leyen, I'd say I'm not in the best position to comment on internal uh, party kind of power <laughs> conflicts, but. Um, it will be interesting to see in the in the elections how this kind of uh, fraction plays out. Uh, and in your paper, you uh, did an analysis on Sweden. And uh, um, one of the questions that was raised by the Sweden Democrats, so the far right uh, political party in Sweden, said that their country has done enough um, about climate and is now um, to the other country uh, to do their part. Could you explain a bit more their position? Yeah, what you can say about the Sweden Democrats is that until very recently, they were quite openly climate deniers for the most part. Um, what you see in their, um, for example, uh, election campaign before the elections in 2022 is that the only questions that they really care about in the kind of domain of energy, climate and environment is fuel prices and not uh, uh, imposing speed limits. Um, so you see that kind of their concern for these questions is quite low. I'd say it's um, as they've come closer to power, as we know, now they are outside of the right wing coalition government, but they are a key player to getting the government, um, giving the government support for their policies. At the same time, we've seen Sweden's climate ambitions decrease. 
um, especially kind of going back on previously agreed upon intermediary targets. But what I want to say is that I'd say that the Sweden Democrats, it's a perfect example of them, okay, um, we uh, have now kind of, because now in Sweden, they have done uh, many things to try to reduce, for example, fuel prices. And this was their core priority um, ahead of the elections. So now, for example, even though they're kind of supporting the 2045 um, Swedish climate neutrality goal, it's quite abstract. There's not, there's not, I don't think it's seen as very shocking for their electorate. But so coming back to your question, Lara, uh, after having given a bit of a, um, a general outline of the situation, I just think this is very typical, uh, you know, climate uh, delay um, tactics that we see um, across these types of parties, but also in other political families more and more, also from the Swedish government. Um, it's a way of saying, since they don't have that type of, um, these types of propositions and ideas which could lead to a socially inclusive um, transition, their way of saying it is that, well, Sweden is a country that has already done enough for the transition um, and we will no longer uh, be on the front line uh, at the expense of um, of the costs of or ordinary people's lives, even though with other types of policy tools, it's something that Sweden, because we really do in Sweden have the kind of uh, the conditions to be a front runner. Um, yeah, I just think it's, um, it's a, it's a typical rhetorical <laughs> trick there um, because they don't have anything constructive to come with to respond to these challenges. And obviously they have another way of, of seeing um, what's important. Uh, there is a second question on the Swedish Democrats. So apparently they just made public that they want to get rid of the mention of EU membership in the Swedish constitution um, with a view to put pressure on the European Union. So what do you think to what extent it could sweet six uh, and endanger the uh, EU green transition in Sweden? Well, regarding that, um, actually, Sweden is among the, the member states who have the, some of the highest support for the European Union membership. But what is a bit um, worrisome about these types of um, um, you know, statements, um, such as the one that the Sweden Democrats recently came with, that they want to remove uh, the kind of uh, sentences that says in, our con in the Swedish constitution that Sweden sh shall be a part of the European Union, is that it also opens the door, um, because from my understanding, even within, so the, our moderate party, which now holds the, um, the prime minister position, there are these kind of uh, tendencies uh, of Euroscepticism. So I think, I think first, this is also um, an election strategy, um, much like the, um, the abolishment of the Green Deal that we saw from Flams Belang and also um, National Rally. Uh, so that's on the one hand. And on the other hand, uh, I think it's worrisome because it opens uh, the doors in other parties that are currently collaborating with the Sweden Democrats to raise more and more critical voices against uh, EU integration and collaboration. Thank you. And maybe a last question. Uh, what can you answer to the politician that we've just mentioned, considering that the EU should slow down on the European Green Deal and press at the expense of China and the US? Um, I mean, it's one of these uh, arguments that are very current, uh, not only coming from this side of the political spectrum, but also others. I believe that it's a question, it's a question if you talk about, for example, European competitiveness, uh, I think it's absolutely crucial uh, that we try to um, 
you know, save and also support some of our big important industries so that they can continue to be important uh, in, a, in a green future. Um, and I think, yeah, it's, uh, so it's the competitiveness angle, but there are also the kind of international um, kind of justice perspectives of historical uh, emissions where we know that the EU um, has a big responsibility to take. Um, yeah. It's a, it's a complex uh, question to answer, but um, I think that at the Institute, at least we, um, we very strongly su support and believe that the EU needs to go uh, ahead uh, also to be a, a credible actor uh, when it comes to international climate negotiations, etc. Thank you very much, Karin, for your presentation, and we will closely monitor uh, your future work on the climate transition during the campaign at the head on energy citizenship. And thank you to you for following today uh, your question. Uh, we will soon send you the replay over to you. So next, next session, sorry, will be held on Wednesday, 20th February. We will have the pleasure to welcome Sylvie Matelli, the director of the Jacques Delors Institute. She will come back to us on the industrial strategy uh, which will, should be presented by the European Commission at the end of the month on defence. Uh, please note that this webinar will be held in French. Thank you again for your participation. Thank you, Karine, and see you in Thank two you. weeks.